Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. It is a great day today. And I know I'm saying that on top of a tutorial cast that people are probably going to watch all over the place and it may not necessarily be today, but if you had anything good happen in your day, it can be a good day. All you got to do is have the right attitude about it. And I think people need to keep that in mind. You don't necessarily have to put on a fake happy face all the time, but just don't keep your head in the gutter and down and out and just lighten up a little bit. Let's have some fun. Today we're going to be talking about Navy and this is one of my favorite topics ever, one of my favorite positions to play and I just knocked something over on my desk. A little bit too enthusiastic here, swinging my arms all over the place. We're going to be talking about how to form a naval strategy depending on what faction you are and how to implement it from the early game all the way through to the late game. This is going to be a long one so sit tight and get ready, but it's a ton of material to go over, so please bear with me. Navy is probably the uh, most intricate uh, subsection of this game, if we're talking about Navy, land, air, and game enders. Um, and a lot of what I say today is going to be personal opinion, what works for me, and general observations about what units do. So there's probably going to be a lot of people that have different opinions and a few people that may straight up disagree with what I say here. But overall, this is just going to be an overview of everything and hopefully it will help you guys out. Now, first of all, when to build Navy, I treat Navy like a T2 factory. So most of your units are going to consume a decent bit of mass. Um, let's just throw down a mass extractor and a couple of pgens and land factory and a naval factory and then we'll talk about this for a minute um mass consumption wise t1 navy is roughly on par with t2 land and then t2 navy is roughly on par with t3 land and then the t3 navy is somewhere in the ballpark of a light t4 unit um, the build times are incredibly high. You're going to need to get a lot of extra build power there, etc., etc., etc. So what's going to happen is if you're going early Navy, I would only build one, maybe two naval factories um, and then assist those with a few engineers so that you can reduce the roll off time of Navy because Navy has tremendously long roll off times. So until you have the eco to support six or seven factories, if you're going for a straight up hardcore naval game, um, you're going to want to assist one or two so that your roll offs are lower. Now, as far as your strategy for Navy itself goes, uh, Cybran and UEF, generally speaking, have the best frigates. Cybran, definitely. So, Cybran is going to be a rush faction. And if you are Cybran, you're going to want to pump out as many frigates as you possibly can, as fast as you can, to get them across the water to pull naval denial on your opponent. And I did spawn an AI here. We're just going to let him run. Cheating's on so I can stop him if I need to. Um, so with Cybran, generally you don't want to build T1 subs right off the bat. Your frigates have huge amounts of health, good damage, good anti-air, they're a solid all-around unit, and even if your opponent already has one or two T1 subs in the water, you're going to be able to tank the damage from that T1 sub for a while while you're killing off all of his build power. You can just forget about the sub. It's going to take forever to kill your frigate, and your frigate's probably going to vet up in the process of killing all those engineers. So let's take a look here. We got our sub pulls 5 mass per tick and the frigate pulls 4 mass per tick, but these units take over a minute to build. The T1 tank, for a reference point, only pulls 4 mass, which is the same as a frigate, but it builds in 13 seconds. So to get any actual firepower on the field, you're going to have to do some heavy assisting to this factory. Both of these have 20 build power, engineers have 5, so to get your roll off time the same for these, you're going to need in the area of about 10 engineers, I think. Um, yeah, somewhere around there. No more than that. Anyway, you're going to need quite a few engineers to get an equal roll off time for these. And that takes a lot of eco to pump out. So you're going to be waiting a few minutes on, on these units. That's just something to keep in mind when you're building these. So Navy, you typically need a lot more build power for the same um, type of unit. Now, Cybern's the rush. 
UEF has a solid rush. And so does Seraphim for that matter. Seraphim, you want to stay away from the T1 subs as much as possible because they suck. Emphasis on suck. They don't even bother build it, making them. It, it just doesn't work. Um, it is better to drop the T2 and go for the destroyers because the destroyers are reasonably good at torpedo damage. Um, so that's that. And then the Aeon is the odd one out. Aeon frigates are the worst of the frigates. They cost the most mass. They have mediocre health, mediocre damage, a marginal range advantage over the other frigates, but nothing really special. And they have no anti-air. All of those drawbacks for the most mass cost. And some of that is made up for by the fact that they have the best Navy-based um, mobile anti-air at T1 or T2 DPS to mash ratio wise, but uh, it's a it's a hard hurdle to get over because you had to mix your navy and they also have torp defense on their frigate. It's the only one that has that. So uh, the three factions besides Aeon, you're gonna want to spam frigates. Aeon, you gotta spam shards and frigates, and you can't expect to win versus the other factions frigates very easily. So that's the early game in a nutshell. Now, as far as executing a naval strategy, if you're on a map this big, especially if you're going like from this island to this island down here, it is actually very effective to get some transports up and drop engineers over here um, so that you can get your factories closer to their shoreline and roll off units faster. It is a tremendous help because by the time a frigate travels from all the way over here to all the way over here, they're going to have a lot of frigates of their own to defend. And it's going to be hard to, well, you're not going to be able to push them out of the water because they're already going to have factories in the water. And it's going to be very hard to overwhelm that uh, when your units are slowly, slowly creeping in single file from your factories way on the other side of the map. So rushing is a very effective strategy when you're doing a full Navy build. Now, some of you may be wondering, I specifically did not choose sentence because I want to speak in generic terms, not specifically what applies to sentence. Okay, so you've got T1 Navy in the water. You're thinking about T2. What do you do? Well, if you're Cybran, you're going to have these awesome units called the Destroyers, the Salems. I'm going to go ahead and spawn a couple of these while I'm rambling on about it. Let's look at some naval units here. Uh, let's check the Navy box. And let's just build one of everything. That'll work. Um, the Cybran is going to be the one that you most want to rush to T2 with because the Cybran destroyer has awesome anti-air, epic range, 80 range, brilliant torpedo damage all around. It is just a great unit. Now it does have a couple of drawbacks that help, uh, weaken it up a little bit versus other T2 Navy units, but if you're gonna pick a faction to rush T2 with, Cybring is probably gonna be the most effective at that. UEF is also very good um, because you can rush out the the um, cruisers for attack damage, and that goes for Seraphim as well. If you can get a cruiser out before they can get a T2 unit online to defend you can actually push across the water with a group of frigates to protect your cruiser and your cruiser and you can factory lock them it is incredibly effective and horribly annoying to deal with if you get factory locked what you're going to do is assuming that they have a um a t2 naval factory here and i am checking my box is wrong we want naval we, eh, let's, let's just forget about it. Um, so you've got your factory here. You can uh, ground fire the TAC missile in between the factory and the unit being produced. And that damage will uh, kill off the unit that's producing. So it locks the factory and it will continually damage the factory itself forcing all of the engineers around it when the units building cycles it will start repairing the factory wasting the mass of the player who owns the factory so it's just an incredibly annoying tactic to deal with 
And like I said, if you reach T2 before they do, and you manage to get your unit across and protect that cruiser, a single cruiser can effectively demolish their hopes of getting Navy in the water. Now, the flip side of that is if they are factory locking you, you have a couple of options. You can drop engineers in another section of the ocean and start a new set of naval factories and just span the ever-living hell out of T1 units because frigates mass to DPS ratio are the best naval units and they're very effective all the way through the T2 stage and have their place even in the T3 stage. Um, so you just hope that you can get enough online before the cruiser finds you and starts factory locking you again that you can deny that. Um, the other option that you have is hover and you can build that from the T2 land factories most factions, except for Cybern, have a hover option, and that is the one drawback of the T2 phase for Cybern Navy. They don't have a hover tank. So if you get forced out of the water, you are completely screwed. Um, it's very, very hard to come back from that. And this is what I was talking about where you want to ground fire. Um, you want to place a attack order like so, and then drag it right there. And that's going to kill the unit in that is building and it's going to damage the factory as well. All right. So you can build hover and you can use that to help force back the intruding Navy or, and you can see the damage racking up there, that AOE on the tax. Or your other option is torpedo bombers. Now with torpedo bombers, you have to keep in mind that the cruisers are going to shoot down T2 torps. And if you string T2 torps in one by one, the cruisers will actually vet off of the torps before the torps can kill the cruiser, which is a sad circumstance. What you have to do is you have to send five T2 torpedo bombers, unless you're Seraphim, in which case I would send more because more than likely some of your torps aren't going to hit due to colliding with other units or getting snagged by torp defense. So five t2 torpedo bombers versus an unvetted cruiser is the magic number they will kill the cruiser in one pass and two or so of the bombers will survive so you want to save up your bombers even though i know you're taking damage i know the cruiser's annoying but you got to wait till you have five and then go after the cruiser that's your three methods of dealing with the cruiser lock and for early intruding Navy. Now, w when you're in that T2 phase, depending on your faction, you've got to remember some of the strengths and weaknesses of your different factions. Um, Cybern, as before mentioned, is going to have the ridiculously strong cruiser and destroyer combo, which is just brutal in the early game versus pretty much any kind of unit. This is the strength of the shard right here. You can see how speedy this thing is. Ah, keeping right up here with that T1 bomber, killing two of them before they could even fly very far. So you're going to want to keep these things handy. They are very strong. Um, so Cybern is pretty much dealt with. One thing you don't want to forget about is the stealth. Um, the mermaid is an essential part of your Cybern navy. Usually if I'm rushing it up, I go uh, cruiser first to make sure that I don't get my first T2 unit picked off by air. And then I will usually drop one or two destroyers and then a stealth. And you can stand off the landmass with a group of stealth Salems and you can just pound the thing into the dirt and they can never touch you because they don't have any radar signatures. They can't target their tort bombers unless they scout first. It's just a bad situation. So use that to your advantage. Um, as far as Aeon goes, Aeon is a tricky T2. They have either the best or the worst depending on how you look at it. In terms of sheer brute damage, DPS, both in surface cannons and in torpedo damage, the Aeon is the best, but it does not have a very good firing pattern. It has very slow projectile speed, it's easily dodged, it has 80 range, so it engages from a long range, and that makes it even more likely to miss. It's, uh, and the firing cycle is four seconds apart. So if you are 
outgunned by Aeon Navy, all you have to do is micro your units in circles or in zigzag patterns and you can pretty much dodge, I, you're going to be dodging about 40% of the Aeon's total damage. They're still going to be hitting you with torpedoes and they're still going to hit you with a gun every now and then. But for the most part, you can negate their entire damage, maybe even more than 40%. It may be more like 70% of the damage, depending on how good you are exactly at dodging those projectiles. You can dodge Cybern some, but not quite as well as the Aeon because it does have a much faster firing rate. So Aeon, if you sit still versus Aeon, you're going to die. If Aeon engages with 20 destroyers versus 20 destroyers, when the numbers start getting big, you're gonna die. But as far as um, 10 or below destroyers apiece in relatively small number engagements, effective micro negates the Aeon destroyer. UEF has a bit of a hard time at T2. You've got to support with frigates. Your destroyer only has 60 range. So it's a little bit harder to intercept the other factions. Um, you've got to run them down or hide behind your shields. The Cooper is an amazing unit. I do not have power at the moment, which is not letting all of my shields and stuff build. Let's see. We're going to go to Aeon Base Experimental and drop ourselves a Paragon back here. Let our power bar fill back up. There's the Cooper shield. That's going to keep your UEF Navy safe from the longer ranged units of the other factions, namely Cybern and Aeon. You have to have the Coopers with the Destroyer. And the other thing that makes UEF hard is the fact that their Destroyer has basically no torpedo damage. Um, it does have 30, but it's pretty much insignificant. You're gonna have to build Coopers. So right off the bat, you're up to three essential units at T2, whereas Aeon can pretty much spam destroyers. Cybern can pretty much spam destroyers. You don't need a whole lot of support units. Seraphim can definitely just spam destroyers. And UEF, you gotta build the three separate units, damage, HP, torpedoes. Where's my Cooper here? It is... Nope. Oh well, we'll find it later. Um, you have to have all three units effectively mixed in order to get the job done. So it can introduce some difficulties and in low numbers UEF Navy is going to have some problems versus the other factions because till you get a sufficient number of units, just the sheer number up, um, your mix is not going to be as effective because you're not going to have enough of any one type of unit. UEF is also a response-driven navy. If they're building only destroyers, you build only destroyers. If they're only building subs, you build a lot of coopers, but still a few destroyers. And, you know, if they're spamming the ever-living daylights out of the long-range destroyers, you're going to want a lot of shields and a lot of frigates um, to give yourself the HP just to tank that damage. So UAF is a little bit tricky to play at T2, arguably slightly weaker than the other factions, but only by a little bit, and more for the difficulty of playing them for the weakness of the actual units themselves. And then last but not least is Seraphim, which I was just microing a minute ago, and not a whole lot to do there, because micro versus T1 is not really effective unless you're kiting, which I wasn't. But the Seraphim Destroyer is the oddball of the T2 bunch, it is a submersible destroyer, which means it doubles as a sub. This is the only torpedo damage dealing unit in the Seraphim Navy that's worth anything in the T1 and T2 stage, and it still has a little bit of an issue. It will lose to the Aeon Destroyer in torpedo damage, so you do not want to go against it submerged, and it comes out about even possibly losing a little bit more than it wins versus the Cybern Salem and it always loses versus Salem's and Mermaids mixed together because Mermaids have epic torpedo defense I mean epic and then the stealth kind of screws with the targeting a little bit so um, Seraphim Destroyer has a little bit of a hard time versus Torps but not too bad you're gonna be able to rely on it fairly well 
for the torpedo damage. What is the main advantage of this though is that it uses beam weapons which are basically undodgeable and it will miss occasionally if it gets a little bit of a glitch here and there but for the most part it is good to go and uh, that lets you zigzag turn dodge do everything you need to do to evade the fire of all of the other factions destroyers even UEF you can pull off an effective dodge once in a while even though you're at really close range um, and that lets you just turn out huge amounts of effective damage even though the actual damage may not be quite as high as the other faction's destroyers. There is less damage on the rear gun than there is on the front gun, so as much as possible you want to either broadside or face frontwards, but it can fire while retreating pretty effectively. And then the submersion part. You can submerge in order to close the distance with longer ranged units. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, the damage that you see being dealt there. You can submerge this in order to chase down a Cybran or Aeon Navy and engage within your own gun range. If you press emerge and then immediately a direction you will emerge as you are traveling and that will let you come within firing range on equal footing instead of trying to chase them while they're, they're kiting you from 20 further range out out here really really good tactic to use and then versus UEF specifically this is brutal because you can move in submerged emerge zap the coopers which are pretty much the only torpedo damage that you're going to have in the UEF Navy unless there's also Atlantis's around zap the coopers and then submerge again and you can calmly and peacefully sit underneath the surface of the water and just demolish the UEF Navy with your torpedoes and they can't do anything about it and it is amazing so that's something that you always want to keep in mind now again torpedo damage generally speaking is always lower damage than the surface value of an equally massed unit so your torpedoes are going to kill their fleet slower. If you're stopping them from killing your build power, or if you need a unit to die right away for some reason, you're going to want to attack it from the surface so that you can bring all of your effective damage to bear. But if time is not essential, if you're just way out in the middle of an ocean somewhere and you want to deal damage over time, submerge it, use your torpedoes. Um, unless you're versus the other two factions destroyers in which case you always want to stay emerged so that is t2 navy in a nutshell i don't think i forgot anything brief mention of the cruisers aeon best overall anti-air and has kind of sort of a long-ranged frigate gun but not very good uh uef second best anti-air in my opinion um for general purposes and you can pair it with the with the bulwark and this is the only cruiser or the uef cruiser with the bulwark is the only one that's going to be able to survive passes of the t3 aeon torpedo bomber um, so that is essential to your navy rush strategy if you're going to be parking units off of their shore and expect to leave them there for any length of time the seraphim cruiser is easily the best versus gunships and large units such as t4s it has a flat cannon and a direct fire non-guided cannon that share uh damage there is more damage on the flak i believe than the direct fire um so it doesn't quite do as well versus solaces or very very fast air units it pretty much can't shoot down scouts the t3 scouts but versus gunships and T2 torpedo bombers in large numbers, this is by far the most effective because of the flak. And then, lastly, the... Uh, which one is left? Cybern. Cybern has very high actual DPS with slightly lower effective DPS than the other uh, cruisers because of its slow projectile speed. So that's just something to keep in mind. Does really well versus gunships because the gunships are close enough that it doesn't waste any fire and it does reasonably well against T2 torpedo bombers but once you start getting into like the Solus strap bombers, um, ASF flying overhead, Cybern cruisers are not going to be very good and you're going to want to do more building of aircraft carriers than of the cruisers. So that's T2 and shifting to T3. 
Actually, let me back up one step. We need to talk about hover because hover is a good part of any effective naval strategy. Your three factions that have hover besides Cybran are usually going to want to mix them in. They not only serve a place denying dan or denying navy that has overrun your build capacity, but they also serve a crucial role within your own navy. They are a pushing force once you get into their build power into their base they're able to go on land they're able to actively spar with the opposing hover that's inevitably going to come towards you um they do very well at killing off engineers and build power and such things so you're going to want to have them in your navy and then for aeon especially it is absolutely critical because Aeon Destroyers, as I was mentioning before, do not have a good firing cycle. It takes four seconds to fire, it misses quite often, it basically can't deal at all with hover, at all, don't even try. So you either have to build frigates or hover to deny frigates or hover. And Aeon Frigates are not that good mass for mass, so unless you're strictly after the speed, because hover tanks are slightly slower than the naval units they're going to be coupled with, you are pretty much down to building. Um, you're pretty much down to building hover, which I have no problem with. Hover is awesome. Are the and there goes the T1 sub. Yep. <laughs> you can see how weak the Seraphim T1 sub is. Um, so you want to have hover, but generally speaking naval units are going to be more effective than hover units are now you may be saying but brink but brink the hover has killed my frigate so many times well one thing that you can do is group your units effectively because frigates don't have a whole lot of range um it is very hard to keep your frigates clumped up and if your frigates are clumped up because the range advantage and the slight uh, well, not even slight. It's a significant HP advantage. That was the wrong button. Forgive me, folks. There we go. Um, you're, because of the range advantage, clumped naval units win so hard versus hover, it is not even funny. So, let's get some more frigates here. Let's drop 50 frigates, which is a realistic number of frigates that you're going to have in your late T2, early T3 phase Navy. Uh, let's get them unclumped here. So typically, when you move your frigates around, um, you encounter this problem where they all spread out, they try to sort up into formation, and then they end up getting picked off by the hover, which clumps much more effectively than the Navy does. Navy units like to take their space. And what you do to negate that is you place a move order, and let's hold down shift and you press G and you see how it splits up every single move order into an individual move order all of them stream together trying to occupy the same spot on the map and that is going to let them clump up effectively so that they can easily match their mass in hover and this may look like a cheesy tactic but it works I'm telling you Use this to your advantage all the time. Shift G is one of the best commands that has come around ever that's been introduced in the UI that I can remember. There is so many things you can use Shift G for. So that just lets you clump everything up. You can see I'm occupying about half the space that I was before um, in the standard formation. So that is going to let you overcome hover pretty easily. All right, enough of that. Let's get rid of those. So you've accomplished what you want to accomplish in the T2 phase. You're wondering about shifting to T3. UEF is going to be your earliest transition. You've got to get battle cruisers out. These are what makes up for the overall mushiness of the UEF T2 Navy. Battle cruisers with bulwarks to support easily beats other factions, destroyers, hover, and frigates. The direct fire beam weapons are similar to the Seraphim in that it delivers almost 100% effective damage. Their DPS is incredibly high that's delivered to target. They have 
very little health for how, ma how much mass they cost, but when you add in some cheap bulwarks, it helps even things out. They have a fairly good cruising speed. They're a bit faster than most other T3 units, although slightly slower than T2 units. And overall, they are going to be an effective matchup versus any other faction's navy. And you've got to have them early versus Aeon and Cybern because of your range disadvantage. So UEF is going to be your earliest jump. You're going to want to drop that T3 factory, get out two, maybe three battle cruisers and a whole bunch of bulwarks. And that's going to hold till you can roll out your mighty summit class, which is the king of all the battleships. This thing can one versus one a Tempest at over two and a half times the cost of the summit. And it can best any other faction's battleship as long as you stay at maximum range in front with your other navy. Because this sucker has 150 range versus 128 for Cybern and Seraphim and 100 for Aeon. So this is going to be another integral part of your navy along with the Bulwark. Bulwarks out the wazoo. I... Honestly, you could probably dedicate a T2 factory with a small amount of assistance to just building bulwarks once you hit the late T2 to T3 phase for UEF Navy. That's where your health is. It's a bunch of cheap health, and you got to have that with your UEF Navy. So that's going to be your jump transition there for UEF. Um, Cybern is also a very good one to move to T3 incredibly early. They have a good, solid battleship. Its biggest advantage is its firing rate. The Cybern battleship fires single cannons at a time of its three, and it creates a very high firing rate. It is the only battleship that can effectively deal with hover. All of the other battleships massively overkill hover and miss quite often. So it's good at dealing with lower tier units and it has the range to best any other factions T2 by a pretty wide margin. So this is going to be one of your better tools in the late T2, early T3 phase. Just something to keep in mind. And the other thing is once you get a secure hold on Navy with Cyber T3, your aircraft carrier is your best friend. It has the health to survive torpedo bombers and it has better anti-air overall than the cruiser does in my opinion um, i've talked about this before cruisers uh, have better overall dps than the aircraft carriers do the difference is the aircraft carriers for twice the mass have literally 10 times the health they cost double the mass, have 10 times the HP with a similar damage statistic on a unit to unit basis. So these guys are not going to die in one pass to the Aeon T3 torpedo bomber, which is your biggest enemy. They're not going to die in one pass to five torpedo bombers or 10 or 15. They're going to shoot down a whole lot of torps before they die. And the Seraphim aircraft carrier actually has the same tack launcher that the cruiser does so you can effectively replace your cruisers with aircraft carriers with no second thoughts you still get the same benefits that you had before actually is that a faster firing rate than the cruiser let me experiment here for guys let's all have a learning session let's uh press attack with this and see what happens see what our spread is that uh, looks that is exactly the same, I think. Let's see, we got one, two, three, four. Yes, exactly the same firing range. So these are the same exact unit, just more HP on this one per mass. So that is your early T3 transition for Cybern. Um, that is the only other one I would go early on. The Seraphim, well, I take that back. Seraphim can sometimes need a t3 push but that's up to what's happening in the game at that time um, the destroyers for seraphim are so freaking good that you may not need to shift to t3 for quite some time but that is up to you what's happening what the opponent's unit mix is uh, if your opponent is extremely torp heavy or you're having a hard time dealing with long range units then you're going to want to shift to T3 to pick up the battleship and the T3 sub. If you're versus UEF 
or if you're versus someone who is incredibly frigate heavy and not building a whole lot of the higher tier units, um, you can stay destroyers. And that will very effectively deal with the frigates and you won't have to drop the mass on the T3 upgrade. It goes either way with Seraphim. You can work early, you can work late, um, e either one. If you're going to go for early, I would make sure that I can get out four to five T3 subs before I, uh, yeah, four to five T3 subs before I was in any great danger of having my build power overrun because you need a lot of T3 subs in a pack to deal effective damage. You have to be able to overwhelm the opponent's torpedo defense and you have to be able to kill units quickly. And again, torpedo damage on a mass to mass basis is generally far less damage than the direct fire counterpart on the surface. So you're gonna want a lot of there subs. Nothing you can do. Yes, there is. I can cheat and create more units. Um, so, Seraphim can go either way. Aeon, I would wait till later. Um, the Destroyer is extremely strong for Aeon. Hover is very strong. You should be able to suppress your opponent very effectively in the T2 stage and give yourself a lot of room to get some reclaim, to get your mass storage built up, to get all of your mexes upgraded that you can before you shift to the T3 phase. And another reason that I say that is you're not gaining a huge range advantage with your battleship over your destroyer. The destroyer has 80, the battleship has 100 range, which is not, it's 20 gain. So it's like the UEF destroyer versus the Aeon destroyer. The battleship, though, has brutal DPS. I think it has 150 DPS more, or 100 DPS more, than any other battleship, with the caveat that it cannot outrange them. Um, but it is also much faster than the other battleships, so it can run down the other faction's navies, and that is an incredibly useful ability. So you're going to want to wait to shift till T late, in the game to shift to T3 with Aeon. And then typically I treat Aeon battleships like I treat UEF battle cruisers. And Aeon is actually the only faction that has an effective answer to the battle cruiser. Because you can spam battleships as hard as UEF is spamming the cruisers. And as long as you drop some mobile shields in the water to counteract the direct fire beams of the battle cruisers, your battleships will be able to effectively deal with the Neptunes. Um, so that is something to keep in mind because I think there's 500 some odd, um, I think there's like 560 or 580 DPS on the Aeon battleship and there's 450 on the other battleships. So, and then this also has twice as much health as the Neptune for a bit more mass. So. Just, just some general things to keep in mind. Now, one thing I did forget to talk about was the T2 sub hunters. Um, Cyber and T2 sub hunters are phenomenal. You want to build them in a reasonable quantity. Um, you're not going to want to, I mean, go completely overboard with it, but they can effectively deal with the T3 sub hunter because their cloak is or their attack range is bigger than the vision radius on the T3 sub hunter and so their cloak lets them not be seen and not be fired on until you're well within range and then once you're within range T2 sub hunters eat T3 alive so that is something that you're going to want to use to your advantage as cyber and cyber and T2 subs can pretty much deal with the entire Seraphim Navy effectively unless you lose air control and then you know you're going to have problems with tort bombers and that kind of thing. So I think the T1 bombers have spotted my Paragon. Oh no! Let's see here. Let's do... Where is the anti-air unit? Oh well. <laughs> we'll just let it die. Um, the... Uh, I lost my train of thought. Shame on me. Shame on me. I'm doing a tutorial and I'm getting distracted. Okay, so the Aeon T2 sub does not necessarily do as well 
as the Cybern T2, but it does still do a good job of delivering torpedo damage. The only problem is it's paired with the Aeon Destroyer, which has infinitely better anti-air, or <laughs> torpedo bomb, torpedo damage. I'm getting distracted again. Just ignore that over there, Brink. Got A D D D D D D D. Um, so there's really not a whole lot of reason to build the Aeon subs unless you have a UEF Navy with no Coopers in it. In which case you can use the T2 Torps to shred the Navy while he is thinking about rebuilding Torps. We're going to see a nuke here in just a minute. So, and moving later into the T3, you're going to have Battleship Wars and Battleship Wars pretty much comes down to who has a better balance of huge economy and huge build power. That is pretty much going to decide it, and then who can micro their shields better. So that's just something that you've got to practice. As far as the experimental units go, the Atlantis can be effectively paired with a lot of Bulwarks and a lot of Coopers. Um, this is going to be the UEF's method of dealing with the T3 subhunters. Atlantises cannot mass effectively deal with subhunters, but a mix of a couple of Atlantises, several Bulwarks, and loads of Coopers can deal with pretty much any number of T3 subs. Once you get enough Coopers in one spot, you pretty much can't hit anything with torpedoes because there's just so much collective torpedo damage there, nothing can get through. So that's something to remember. And then the Aeon Tempest. The Tempest is somewhat of a showboat. I, I'm not sure how to describe it. It loses mass for mass to every single other battleship and it has the same range as the UEF battleship. You can build it and it will outrange Cybran, another Aeon opponent, or Seraphim, but the it's not very cost effective. So unless you have huge fields of reclaim, you're not going to come out ahead building this. But then again, if you can build two or three of them, the splash is so big and the alpha strike is so big, these things can drop shields in a heartbeat and kill units. I mean, it's one-shot KOs. Hey, look, a Soul Ripper. <laughs> I'm going to run my little commander in here. Um, so that is just another thing to bear in mind. You can use them, but maybe not the best thing that you can build. Um, Aeon, you're going to want to just spam tons and tons and tons of the, the, the battleships. The other unit that they have that's unique is the Torrent, which I've talked about before. It has the longest range of any naval unit except the Strat sub. Um, which does have a longer range on its TAC missile, but the Torrent does way more DPS and is just a good all-round unit. Something a lot of people don't realize is that this also has huge amounts of torpedo defense. I mean, huge amounts. Um, I wouldn't say mix it into your navy for the torpedo damage, or the, for the torpedo defense, but it is there and you can make use of it if you so wish. The last unit that we're going to talk about is the strategic sub. Um, Cybran is which one is it it's that one up there all right Cybran has a torpedo launcher it does about 200 dps but it costs 10,000 mass i think or 9,000 it costs a thousand more than the other factions subs but the torpedo damage is not worth the extra mass to build it as a combat unit it can defend itself from one or two t2 subs and you know a couple three four t1 subs it's not completely helpless but it is not meant to be a combat unit this thing has stealth it hides away in a corner of the map builds a nuke when you're ready to launch said nuke you move into range with the red ring and you fire that sucker and kill whatever you're aiming at so Cybern is the odd one out. It is the sneakiest and the best able to defend itself then you've got the Aeon and UEF which are basically identical You've got the TAC launcher, which fires inside the red circle here, does huge amounts of damage. There goes the Paragon, that one lonely T1 bomber finally killed it. Um, one thing that is cool with these is that you can pair two or three of them up, and you can fairly easily overwhelm TMD with them. Um, I say that. They fire in somewhat of a good pattern to kill... TMD as long as there's not a whole bunch of it in one specific spot and you can use these to kill the SMDs uh, Guarding the shoreline once you kill the SMD you will be able to fire the nuke onto it I'm sorry the yellow line is the tack range here 
So that is something to bear in mind that you do have two tools at your disposal, but these tacks are fairly easy to recognize. So if you start firing with them, you may clue your opponent into the fact that you do have nuke subs, which could end badly for you. So that's just up to you whether or not you want to potentially expose them in order to effectively use the tacks. The only other unit that has subs, or unit that has nukes, not subs, uh, is the Hotham, the Seraphim T3 battleship. This is a nuke launcher. It costs, uh, you pay a thousand mass for the ability to nuke, so it is a little more expensive than the other battleships, and that's what you're paying for. Um, so, yeah. I think. Now I'm getting my database confused. Someone will correct me in the comments if I am incorrect about that. It may be the same price as the other battleships. And I would be terribly sorry if I'm confused about that point, but I'm not going to take the time in the cast to go look it up. All right, so that is, in a nutshell, the Navy game for Supreme Commander. Hopefully you learned something. There was a lot of little tidbits in there, uh, bits of strategy that may not have been completely cohesive, but hopefully it will give you a good idea of what you're dealing with, maybe clue you into some of the strengths or weaknesses of a faction. Weaknesses, knowing what you need to avoid is sometimes as big a part of playing this game as knowing what your strengths are. If you can play against your weaknesses and for your strengths, you can do a whole lot better than just trying to say, oh, this unit is really good at this one thing, so let's just throw it in there and do that. Just, it's a balance, it really is. I think that's all I've got to say about this. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, obviously there's gonna be tons of comments on this one. You, The Navy game is so expansive, there's absolutely no way that I can cover it in one tutorial. That is the biggest things that I thought needed mentioned. Obviously there's other stuff, the Cyber and Torpedo Commander, uh, more in depth with the torp bombers, things like that. But that's getting into little nitpicky strategies that may only work on certain maps and in certain situations. So this is the best overview that I can give you. All right, I'm gonna stop rambling there. Again, I hope all of you had an awesome day. I really wasn't kidding about that in the beginning of the cast. If you get in the right mindset, I know sometimes life gets you down. If you just put your foot down and say, you know what? I'm going to ignore any of the bad stuff that happened today and I'm going to focus on the good stuff, set a new record at work, did you know this, that, or the other thing that made me happy. There was a little bright spot in the day. Person I love is right over here and I can grab his or her hand and we're fine together. Whatever it may be, find a bright spot in your day and be happy for once. I would love to know that everybody had a smile on their face at least once and if it was during my cast, I do thank you kindly. I will see you in the next video. Thursday for a game cast. Adios, folks.